You know, I think that's one of the things that the enemy is trying to do in this world is try to make you think you're insignificant. He's trying to make you think that you have no ability. He's trying to make you think that it doesn't matter what you do. It, it's only affecting you, but that's a lie because we saw that when we began to act that God would use us in all kinds of different ways. And then last week, uh, we saw that if I would just move my thinking and quit uh, being so arrogant and so prideful in life and realize that I need Jesus, Amen. that I could set all this worry down, all this weight that I try to carry. I could put it to the one who has come uh, to take it from me, and I could be free from the schemes and the traps that the devil has to put out, that he has put out there for us. And, and as we've gone through this, I pray that somewhere you have learned to unleash what Christ can do through you. And today it is no different. And I'm going to end up on probably what was going to be the hardest one for me to preach, mainly because this is something that as a Christian, we don't teach each other this. We, we teach that our, our belief comes totally by faith. And we talk about that I don't need to, to, to have visuals in my life. I just go off of my gut feelings and the feelings of my heart. But this morning, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that sometimes we need to unleash our vision. And sometimes I need to see to believe. Anybody in here need to see something to believe something? I mean, I'm, I'm a very visual person. I like to be able to see so that I can correlate and I can say there's validity in it because my eyes will allow my heart to believe mainly because they saw it with truth. You know, there are things that happen in our lives and around us that we need to see to believe. And yesterday, I did a short poll on Facebook asking people, what are some things that happen in this world that we need to see to believe. You know, we're in communities and we know a lot of people. And if, and if somebody comes to you and they tell you a story and, and they might use somebody's name and say, well, he said, we a lot of times we'll follow it up. Well, if he said it, then I need to see it to believe it. Do you know many people like that? So as we were going, and I was, I had a little fun with this and I began to see this. People, people began to put on there and they said, you know, I need to see you know, that you killed a monster bug, not that you just take one. I want to see a picture of them. They went on and they said that, I want to see honest politicians. And I think everybody wants to see that at some point in time. I kind of laughed about that. They said, uh, sometimes I need to see family members be on time in things that they do in life. And my favorite one was people saying that they need to see Bigfoot to believe in him. And, and, and I, I, I'm a big fan of Bigfoot, and I really want to see him one day, but the only way I can believe him is I need to see some tangible evidence, you know, uh, of that. But there's things that we look, and in fact, all areas of our life, these things that we hear about and we tell people about, but we just can't believe it unless I see it with my very own eyes. Unless that I have some part in that, and I'll take you on your honesty, but sometimes I want to say, you know what, that sounds far-fetched. I'm not saying that he's not telling the truth, but I just don't see how that can happen because one of the worst things that happens is my mind begins to process what's going on. My mind begins to reason out that it's not physically possible for them to do that. And as I sit there and believe and thought about that, if I need to see proof on something as small and simple as a buck that has been taken during our local hunt season, if I need to see proof that either he's been taken or I need to see proof that he's in the area on a game camera, what kind of proof do I need when it comes to my spiritual life? I'm going to take all my religion and I'm going to set it down and be real with y'all this morning, church, because we all sometimes need to see proof of God working in our life. Yeah. We need to see God active in our life. And this morning... We, what would make it so real? What would make God so real in your life? What would you need to see that you would say, I'm willing to put all my hope and trust into him? You know, what if I already believe in God? What would make me realize that my God is capable of overcoming and delivering me from certain situations in not only my life, but in my family's as well? I'm not coming in here to make anybody question God. What I'm trying to do is show you that God is going to show you exactly what he's done and has been showing you your whole life. The enemy has put blinders on God's people. The enemy has covered what you see. And today, God is going to unleash your vision so that you can see him in grace and truth and all power that is deserved in his name. 
You know, and I want you to join with me as we look at two stories that I believe will help us relate to how we view our lives and what's happening so that we can actually see. Look with me here this morning in John chapter 20. I'm going to read verses 24 through 25. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 24, and it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, and see in his hands the prints of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Y'all give with me and pray this morning. Every Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day. And Lord, I pray that you just bless me. Lord, hide me behind your cross. Behind the, behind the cross, Lord, let me speak your word with power and truth. And Lord, let me... Let me relay the message that you have given me this morning, Father, that the enemy is trying to stop us from seeing who you are. Lord, the enemy is trying to keep us from understanding what you have done and going to continue to do in our life. Lord, I pray that you would remove those blinders from our eyes, from our heart, from our soul, and from our mind. Lord, let us worship you for these next few minutes, God, with, with this true love for who you are. And we ask this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, as I, as I had to talk about seeing to believing, I could not start without speaking about this verse. You know, and I believe sometimes Thomas gets a bad rap. I mean, he walked with Christ. He talked with Christ. He seen everything that Christ had to offer. But in this one moment, these two verses, people began to condemn him. I've, been, I've said it in many places and I've heard pastors say, don't be a Thomas. Just believe, but sometimes, church, we need to see something to believe in. We need to know that there's something going on. And Thomas is being real with the other disciples. Look here with me. They had witnessed so many miracles. They walked through so much. They had been through so many things. They had seen Jesus heal. They had seen him cause the dead to come back to life. He had witnessed the moving and the changing of lives. Could you imagine what it was like for Thomas? To see Jesus call Lazarus out of the grave. Just by the words. Come out. And they had all witnessed. The agony that Jesus went through. On the cross. They had witnessed the lifeless body of Jesus. Being taken down. And being carried and put into a tomb. They had watched the wall. The, the stone rolled in front of it. They had watched the royal guard. Seal it and stand there. And now. The one that had done so many things is gone. You know, let me tell you something. The world has a great way of taking away your faith. By things you see. Because what happens is, even though you see it, your eyes can deceive you to what's going on. And if you don't believe that, go hunting and let it start getting dark. Do you not begin to see things? Do you not begin to imagine things? And if you look long enough, your eyes will deceive you. They had been all part of these first time, these accounts firsthand. And a couple of them were blessed enough to see the empty tomb. And then all of a sudden, if you will, look back with me. A couple of verses there to verse 20. Thomas now was not with them. He was off doing whatever he was doing, if the scripture does not say. But all of a sudden, in the midst of this room, because the disciples... Where were scared. They were, they were locked in. So where was their faith? I mean, God told them he was going to protect them. He was going to guide them. But they're behind locked doors in an upper room. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears before them. And he announces and he says, peace. For I am be with you. But look at verse 20. Thomas is the only one that is charged of being doubtful. But look what Jesus did in verse 20. He says, when he, when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands. And his side. His side. One thing I have noticed about my God. He wants you to see that he's real. He wants you to see that he's active. If all of a sudden he had just come in there. There had never been any proof. There would have been doubt that began to form inside their mind. But our God is a visual God. Because he knows that the enemy is using our eyes to deceive us. So God will use his, our eyes to point out the truth. When Jesus showed them nails, prints, was there any lie in who he was? When he showed the, the piercing in his side, was there any lie to who he was? 
Church, let me tell you something. He talked about the nails in his hands and the piercing in the side, but I promise you they were still scars from where the crown had been. Jesus wants us to see because there is truth in what we see. And everyone has a moment of doubt. All of a sudden, Jesus is standing there showing his side. He looked the same. He sounded the same. His even gentle presence in the voice was the same that would stir them up. But Jesus said, I need to show them who I am. Church, let me tell you something. Our God has been showing you who he is every day since you've been born. But see, the enemy puts something in front of us to keep us from seeing that. Somebody might be here sitting this morning saying, it's been a long time, Pastor, since I saw who God was. If you saw the sun rise, you've seen him this morning. Amen. He has proven that. And this is good news right here, you know. Uh, we have disciples that have seen and have, and he goes on and it says, once that he, had, he showed himself, he laid his spirit upon them. And that's good news because all that's got to happen, right, is that somebody, one person needs to believe in Christ. One person needs to have the spirit put upon them. And then everybody will believe, right? Because if that's true, if what I just said was true, the whole world will be saved. Because if there was one man or one woman inside this church house this morning that truly loved God, that truly had an anointing of the Spirit, it would only take that one person for everybody to be saved. But that's not what happens. Christ revealed himself to them. He saw his power and he gave them the Spirit. But then Thomas wasn't there. He didn't receive the spiritual anointing from Christ. And even in all of the disciples' excitement, this wasn't enough to spur Thomas on. Let me ask you something. Have you ever had a friend that was so excited about something? I mean, that they were just charged up, but their excitement didn't carry over to you? I have a friend that is just beside himself that they're going to play the Super Bowl tonight. I mean, he is just, he is just living about it. Man, it's going to be awesome. But I had to wake up this morning and ask myself, who's playing? I had to look it up. Was the day the Super Bowl Sunday? I didn't really know. I mean, it's been in the news, but I hadn't been watching that. I hadn't been checking it out. I didn't know that the 49ers were going up against the Chiefs today. I did look and see that 100 million people are expected to watch the Super Bowl. So that many people are anticipating. They have an excitement for it. But it doesn't mean that everybody gets excited about something. So even these disciples who had been touched, had been anointed, had seen God, Thomas, was still dealing with something, not just doubt, but his disappointment in life. Let me tell you something, church. The biggest driver of your, of your doubt is disappointment. <laughs> Have you ever been disappointed and it's caused you to think, I'm not good enough? I'm not worthy? Yeah. See, that's a, that's a tool of the enemy. And all too often in this world, doubt is brought by this disappointment. It's not because we had a lack of faith. It's just that we understand what it's like when we don't get what we hope for. See, all of a sudden, Thomas just believed that Jesus wasn't going to go on that cross. He was going to establish his kingdom. He was going to call down that legion of angels. Could you imagine what it was like to see his heart? Watch Christ get on that cross. Watch Christ take his last breath. And watch them carry him away and stick him in a tomb. Facing doubt in this world is a constant battle for no matter what age we are and no matter where our walk of life is. Verse 24 or verse 25, and the disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, it didn't mean that he didn't believe in God. He just says, I don't think this is what's happening right here. Now, I, I, I sit there and I look at this story. And I got to thinking about Thomas and the doubt and the disappointment he's going through. And this is the angle that I was going to bring with you this morning that, the God, that God wants me to lay out there before you. See, Thomas was facing doubt and disappointment of his Savior being gone. But see, somebody in here this morning is facing doubt and disappointment because your struggle has not been lifted from you. The weight that's on you has not been taken away. The, the pain that you've been facing is still there. And yeah, it sounds good for a pastor to say, God says my grace is enough. But when that weight is pulling you down, sometimes I begin to think, I don't think God cares for me. 
God does not see what I'm going through. And we just begin to get beat down by the world. And when that weight starts pulling us down and our eyes start to cast down, we no longer see the true power that's in God because all we can see is the next step that I'm trying to make, the next step that I'm trying to survive in this world. I want you to flip with me real quick over into 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel <coughs> chapter 17. I had to talk about Thomas. And I had to talk about what he was facing. And, and how it was so real to him. That all of a sudden it just had him beat down. Not that he didn't love God. Not that he didn't trust God. But he just thought that this is it. It's not going to happen. And sometimes we hope for stuff. And sometimes we pray for stuff. And when a period of time goes by so, so long. And God doesn't deliver. We begin to think it's not going to happen. I mean Thomas was the same way. He just knew that the power of God was going to shine through. And he was going to take over at that instant, set up his kingdom. But when all of a sudden they carried him off the cross into the grave, sealed it, and they had to walk away and leave a lifeless body, his hope began to fade. And I can't talk about doubt without talking about victory. Sister Lane and Sister Robin sang a beautiful song right here. Victory in Jesus. Now y'all don't know that. But that song was not scheduled to be played this morning. Satan's been working on our, on our choir. He's been trying to move it around. But what Satan don't know is God's also been working through our choir. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what my message was going to be on. And therefore they picked the song based on what God made on their heart. Because God knows somebody needs to understand that victory is of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Not of the enemy. Amen. And this morning I couldn't talk about victory without going back and seeing... The story of David and Goliath. And no, I want you to notice this morning. We may not be David. But not always the victory I witness needs to be mine for me to understand how powerful my God is. I don't need to be the one that's staring down the face of the giant to realize that God is a deliverer. That God is powerful. Sometimes I just need to look out and see my brothers or sisters beating the enemy to realize that if my God can drive through them. He can drive through me. You know, as I was writing this, I was thinking, I love to win. There is no questions about it. I like to be a winner. If you don't believe me, ask John. I have never let him win anything as much as a foot race or a game of chess if I can help it since he was little. Sean used to tell me all the time, honey, he's a little boy. Let him win. And I'm like, no. Because if he wins, then I'm a loser. And I ain't going to have that. He needs to learn this support because there's going to come a point in time to where he will be able to outsmart me. So I'm going to use my angle right now. So I'm going to win at all costs. But I want you to think about 1 Samuel right here and David. Before David showed up with the loaves of bread and the stacks of cheese in the car that Jesse had sent for his brothers. Before Jesse realized that my sons, my three oldest sons have been at war. Before Jesse said, I'm worried, this battle had been set in the rain. The Philistines was on one side. The nation of uh, Israel was on the other side. Saul had it all set in a rain. It was a glorious display of power between the two forces. Long before David showed up, the battle was going on. It said it was happening for 40 days. Each day they set up everything in order. But I noticed there for 40 days, they were not moving upon it because what was before them began to frighten them. And it said that Goliath for 40 days walked down off the mountain into the valley and would challenge the nation. Let's don't spill the whole nation. Just send one man down to me. Send him down. But every man began to lose heart. And I've come to find out that as one day passes to the next day, it gets harder to lose. It gets easier to not act on what God wants us to do. Amen. And it gets easier for me to realize how weak I am. And I begin to believe what that enemy is saying. And I can only imagine the journey. I saw left out of the castle and they were heading to this plain and they was getting on the mountaintop. All the nation of Israel was probably geared up. We can do this. They have come against us. God is on our side. Man, the excitement, the power that was behind them. <clears throat> but each day that they did not attack, 
was the day that the enemy was robbing them of their courage. Let me ask you something, church. Has life, the days, and the years robbed you of your belief in just how God, good God is? It does for me sometimes. Especially when I'm sitting there looking at something that's bigger, that's stronger, that's more powerful than me. When I'm faced with something that's there, and it's at this moment in time, until all of a sudden I realize that what is before me is greater, that I will never be able to face it. And right then is when the enemy has me exactly where he wants me. He has me in a state of defeat. But look with me in verse 50. I said that the victory does not have to be mine for me to believe in God. Let me, let me ask you, you've got to raise your hands on this. How many of y'all believe that God is an overcomer? Amen. Have you seen somebody that's overcome something? Maybe it's substance abuse, maybe it's alcoholism, maybe it's sexual uh, addiction. Have you seen somebody or known that known of them and their struggles? And you've seen God deliver them? Yeah. Now, it didn't, it didn't exactly happen to you because that ain't the hand you was dealt. But you want somebody who was able to do that. So if God could deliver them from some kind of situation, what could God deliver you from? Amen. See, you saw a victory every Sunday when somebody comes to this altar and they lay their heart out to God or when they walk down here and they pray and say, I want God to be the, the king of my life. I see victory, not in me, but in their life. And I'm reminded every day that God is a deliverer and a redeemer of souls that love him. Amen. And all of a sudden, this scared nation of Israel for 40 days had been there. And in verse 50, sometimes I need to see the victory in my life. Verse 50, it says, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. And he smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of of David. You know, as I was reading verse 50, man, I, I, that just really spoke to me. There was three things that revealed, that God revealed to me. First thing I saw there was the enemy had fallen. The foe that was before me, the enemy that had me scared, somebody was able to feed him. So when all of a sudden I look there and I see, hey, the greatest thing they've got has just fell, fallen before somebody who is, uh, who is weaker than me what was the common denominator? It was his faith in God. So if God could defeat him, what could God do for me? He defeated him, this unbeatable foe, and now he's standing over him. Then he goes on and he took the sword from the enemy. The one thing the enemy was challenging me with, that he was threatening me with, that he said he would destroy, destroy me with, now David has taken it away from him and used it on him. You know, as I, as I was writing that, I was thinking, what's the one thing that scares everybody in this world? Death, right? Because that's what the enemy tries to use against you. But what did Jesus do with it? He took it away from him. And he says, I hold the keys to death and Hades. Not you. This is not something that you can lure over somebody. This is now belongs to me. So this enemy who had been taunting, who had been using this thing against you all of a sudden had it stripped and it's away from him. And all of a sudden we see that their champion in verse 51 at the end of it, it says their champion was dead. There are things in our lives that we need to see. There are things in our lives that loom over us and scare us. And the best way for them to be gone is to watch them die. And sometimes I don't need to be the one that faces them. I get my strength when somebody else overcomes it through the same God that I serve. Amen. Too often in this world, too often in this world, we are waiting for God to line us up against Goliath. We're waiting for God to put the stones in our hands to make us the champion. But sometimes God just wants us to sit there and be still, church, and watch him work through the lives of your brothers and sisters. Amen. And to be instructed by them so that we can see his hand. But that mighty hand sometimes moves in somebody else's life. You know, the victory doesn't always have to be mine 
when I witness it. But there is times that I need to witness the enemy losing. I don't always need to see the winnings. But church, let me tell you something. I need to see the Savior fall in this world. I need to be reminded that he is beneath our feet, that God has already crushed his head. For 40 days, they stood there defeated. And I'm wondering right now how many of you are sitting in this house that feel defeated. You say, well, preacher, I've been looking at this enemy for a lot longer than 40 days. I've been fighting. I've been going, and I'm scared to challenge him. Feeling like he was stronger and he was better than, than I am. And you see, sometimes God doesn't want you to experience the victory. He wants you to experience the defeat. You said, well, preacher, I still don't understand that. Back in the early 90s, there was a boxer known by the name of Mike Tyson. Y'all might have heard it. He was, he was, he was well. And everybody was scared of him until he was defeated. And when he was defeated, all of a sudden, people said, I see his weakness. I see his fault. I know how to overcome him. See, and that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to look down and he wants you to see that the enemy that's been coming after you, he's defeatable. Other people are defeating him. He wants you to look at their victory and say, I know exactly now what I need to do. Goliath and the Philistines was the enemy of the nation of Israel. The soldiers were battling. David just happened to come along at the right time. I mean, here was a shepherd boy. Jesse just happened to want to know how his sons were doing. And he just happened to get there at the time that they were going to war. Had David been two hours earlier or two hours later, the story might have been different. <clears throat> but God's timing is impeccable. God's timing is perfect. And all of a sudden, he came... Not so that he could become the king that God had designed him to be. He came so that the nation of Israel could see their greatest enemy defeated. Amen. Church, I'm telling you tonight, this morning, <clears throat> that God is coming before you to tell you that your greatest enemy is defeated. See, when we get scared of the enemy, we won't fight because of the fear. Verse 51, David ran and he stood upon him. And he pronounced the champion was dead. And in verse 52, it says that the men of Israel and Judah arose and they cursed at David because he had the victory and not them. Ain't that what we do as Christians? When somebody is able to overcome something, we, we get mad at them. When somebody is able to overcome something, we, we, we're, we're, we're animos we have animosity toward them because they can do something. Well, what does it say right here in verse 52? And the men of Israel and Judah arose and they shouted because the victory had been revealed to them. The defeat of the enemy let them know that if this shepherd boy could drop this giant in his tracks, this army is nothing for a well-trained nation of God. And it's sad that they pursued the Philistines until they come to the valley and at the gate. They drove them all the way back out of their lives this morning, church. That enemy has come upon you and he's standing there right now. They didn't need a hero and neither do you. All they had to do was see what their God was able to do when a man or woman unleashes the power of God in your life. <coughs> David simply went before Goliath as he was. He said, I come at you in the name of God. This morning, church, I'm telling you, there are brothers and sisters all over the world that are going after the enemy in the name of God. And you know what that enemy is doing? Being defeated. This morning, that one that you've been fearful of, I'm confident that there's somebody here who's been feeling defeated and put down. There's somebody here that says, you know what? As I look around and I see the people that are sitting around me, I see a lot of victories that have happened in the name of God. I've seen cancer that's been healed. I've seen marriages that's been uh, restored. I see victories inside this house by my common brothers and sisters. God, I don't need to witness the victory because I've seen you defeat my enemy. <coughs> this morning, we're not in a house just mortal sinners that aren't deserving of the love of God that the enemy would have you to believe, but we're in a room full of victories that we have each been able to witness. 
This morning, I'm going to ask you, can you see the defeated enemy before you? Can you see the love of God in people's life? Can you see how God has built people up and, and delivered them from all their struggles? That same God that's given victories in other lives will give the victory in yours. This morning, I pray that as you have witnessed the defeat of an enemy, you realize that it has came from the hand of the one true God, and that is Jesus Christ. I pray this morning that we will turn loose of what we see that we're, uh, we're unable to imagine, but we turn loose and we see an enemy that is defeated, that that blood that was shed has given us all the power we need. And it lies within your heart, within your grasp. Will you call out to him this morning? Let's go to our Lord in prayer today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for allowing us to overcome our enemies. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to go face first with him, Lord, and just be matched with him, not by our own strength, but God, by your love and by your strength that flows through us. Lord, I thank you even more that even though I don't have to go to battle, Father, you let me see your battle-tested uh, servants, and they're enough an example Lord, to let me see that enemy can be defeated by anybody who comes at him in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, this morning I pray that you just cast out all uh, despair, Lord, all depression, Lord. I ask that you just help those that feel beat down, Lord, those hopeless. Lord, I pray that you let them see that all things are possible through the strength that lives within us, and that is in your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let us